It's Sunday. Mother's Day. Let's talk about fighting. Ladies love that, right? <laughs> A good old battle, war, big machines, clash of metal. However, I do want to stay married, so let's pick a battle that ladies may appreciate. So, here we go. Does anybody remember those old uh, drag race commercials or monster truck commercials? So, think of those if you see this. But Sunday, 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 live in the Thunderdome, the banks of the Keyshawn. It's Deborah versus the Iron Chariots. In one corner, we've got a little old lady, Deborah. She's a prophetess whose names mean B. And she enjoys a good shade tree. She even has a palm tree named after her. In the other corner, we've got Jabin's big bad commander, Sisera. He's a Canaanite general with an army sporting 900 iron chariots. The side alone of these war machines has already frightened off Israel's armies in the past. Will Deborah be able to take them on and win? Now, let's ring the bell, get the party started, and find out, shall we? But first, let's set the scene. Let's start with the odds. We'll get to the battle in just a moment. The army Cicero controlled had 900 iron chariots. Now, they weren't like this, but if you think about it, an iron chariot was the tank of the day. That's kind of what they were facing, 900 tanks. Now, that's only the chariots. Now, imagine there's still other troops and other armaments. If this army is wealthy enough, and mechanically inclined enough to outfit functional chariots covered in iron. Can you imagine what else they had in their arsenal? Even without the other armaments. Imagine taking on an iron chariot. Imagine how overwhelming these chariots were against regular soldiers. If you're a regular soldier at the time, you didn't have much armor. This wasn't the Knights of the Round Age. You didn't have suits of armor. And most of you had some thick leather. And the Israelites weren't an established nation at the time. They didn't have a standing military. So these were Minutemen, so to speak. These were farmers, tradesmen, they answered the call to war. Picked up their sword or spear and took off, mostly on foot. Towards the battle was set to take place. These volunteers were up against a trained army with heavy weapons. Those iron chariots were effectively the tanks of the time, and there are no missile launchers to take them out like we have nowadays. Given the odds, it's pretty easy to see why the Israelites did not want to fight the iron chariot, let alone 900 of them, and a whole slew of infantrymen, infantrymen to go with them. In normal circumstances, Israel would be slaughtered off the bat. They were going up against a vastly better equipped army, that sister commanded. Now, given the setup, let's see how the commander of Israelites responded when Deborah tells him, It's time. Let's do this. Turn with me to Judges 4 4 through 8. This is a scripture reading from this morning. Judges 4 4 through 8. Beginning in verse 4. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, when Judge of Israel at the time, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up for her, to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord called the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulon? And you, against you, I would deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, the river Kishon, and I would deliver him to your hand. Apologize for my lady's voice. I'm not going to do that well. But <laughs> Brock says, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, when you first read that, how many of you thought Brock saying, Mommy, hold my hand? Kind of how it comes off, right? But think of the circumstances. If Deborah was not a real prophetess, if she was simply fed up with King Jabin terrorizing the army of the Israelites and the commander Sisera, Sisera basically running over everybody, she was sending him and all of his men to certain death. 
Brock is probably thinking there's only one good way to find out if she stands by her statements, and that's to bring her along. Maybe. I know a lot of what you ladies are thinking. If this was a guy, he wouldn't have asked so much questions, right? He would have gone. Maybe. But in reality, should it have mattered whether it was a male or female giving that message? No. It was a message from God, and that is what Barak was forgetting. Deborah was counted a prophetess, and that's not a title you get easily. That means she had had to present prophecies that had come true to get that. She had the credentials. Barak wasn't trusting in God. The children of Israel had strayed far from God, and that's why Jabin and Sisera were there, as 900 chariots exist in the first place. God was using Deborah to show himself to the Israelites and remind them of who he was and who they should not have strayed from. Barak should have recognized that. He should have recognized the message from God was a sure bet, no matter how scary it might seem. But flip that. What about Deborah? What about her? If she was wrong, she would be sending 10,000 Israelites, her fellow countrymen, to their death. And she knew this. However, let's look at her reaction versus Barak's. Let's read on, starting in verse 8 again, and going to verse 9. Judges 4, 8, and 9. And Barak. Barak said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Gadesh. Simple, right? She got up, she went. With Deborah, there is no hesitation. There is no, just let me pack a few things. Nothing except, let's do this. She also had a word of warning for Barak of what he was actually asking. Now at this point, who do you think the woman was who God was going to sell Sisera's in the hand to? It seems like Deborah, right? But you, as we read on, you'll find out it's not. And Deborah knew this. She had the message. She knew how this was going to play out. She was getting up to go to a battle that would, in all circumstances, be certain death and not even getting the glory. And she knows this, and yet she goes, no hesitation. Deborah headed out, no expectation of glory. No hesitation. She was a prophetess delivering the message, and she knew what was going to happen. She's not a warrior. She's a lady that enjoys sitting under a good tree. Think how she would do under an iron, against an iron chariot. Yet, she did not flinch or hesitate. She went. If God gave you a mission for your family, would you head out without a moment's notice or a moment's hesitation even if the circumstances were astronomical against you? What would you do? Now, let's go back to that battle, and let's see how that battle plays out. Jump down to Judges 4, 14 to 16. Begin in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Brock, Oh, but this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Farosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Now, that's the quick, simple prose version. Very compact, right? And this version is very quick. Sounds like Barak and Arm. And the army did the work, right? I went out there, slew the army, chased them down, slaughtered them. Now they did do some work. But let's look at the song version, the version and verse, in the next chapter, chapter 5. And let's shed some more light on this battle. Turn over to chapter 5, and let's start in verse 5. Actually, right, verse 4. And we'll see that Deborah, this is a song from Deborah and Brock. And they actually acknowledge who did the work. Judges 5, verse 4. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. 
the mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai, Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel. God. God is a real picture. God sent a torrential rainstorm. The chariots were in the plain. Now, if you know tanks, that's where they're strongest. Open, flat, filled. That's where a tank can just tear across and shoot across and just tear things up, right? That's their strong point. But have you ever seen a tank in the mud? It doesn't do so well. <laughs> now, tanks are pretty much useless once the mud gets deep enough. But it gets worse. Let's read on down to verses 20 and 21 because there's more. Judges 5, 20 to 21. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. It was not only heavy rains, it was a flood. The river Kishon, where Sisera's armies and all of his men were assembled, flooded. They were already stuck in the mud. The flood was an insult to injury. Those 900 chariots, pretty much useless at this point in time. They're not going anywhere. You can read back accounts of like World War I and World War II, where, where tanks got stuck in the mud. Exact same thing happened to them. This is a modern day tank. As you can see from the look of the guy's face, he is not going very far. <laughs> now, if you're the coach of a sports team, we've all been watching the Warriors, right? If you've got a sports team and you've got these seven foot, 300 pound players that your whole playbook is basically get the ball to those guys, all those guys are out, what happens to your playbook? It's gone, right? <laughs> it's thrown in the trash. Your whole plans, your whole idea of what you're going to do. Done for. That's what happened to Sisera. His whole playbook was trashed. Now, beyond a sports team, imagine this is a life and death event, and you've got 10,000 angry men armed and running at you. What do you do? Do you have much left except to run away? Not really. And that's exactly what Sisera did. The commander of the army fled. Turn down to Judges. Turn back. To Judges 4, 17 through 20. Judges 4, 17 through 20. Start in verse 17. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, or Yael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Yael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. And then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes and inquires you, say, Is there any man in here? You should say, No. So, think about this. Sister had ran. He ran far. He was exhausted. And he found what he thinks is a safe place. It goes in the tent. Heber's house wasn't at war with Jabin. He was, and this was Heber's wife. Surely he was safe, right? He would live to fight another day. Today was really bad, really, really bad. His team got wasted. But he would go on. So he was exhausted. But he made it to what he thought was a safe spot. He asked for water. She does him one better. She brings him a bowl of milk and a blanket. He's feeling pretty good, right? It's time for rest, and then go regroup, fight another day. And let's read on. Verse 21. Then Yale, he his wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down to the ground where he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And then, as Barak pursued Sisera, Yale came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with the peg in his temple.
So, okay, sent back to the temple. Sister may have chosen the wrong tent, right? It wasn't Deborah. It wasn't Barak. It wasn't the armies. It was a lady in a tent who got the big bad commander of this army of 900 chariots. Got him to relax, take a nap, and then take a really long permanent nap with a pen nail to the head. God chose a lady who sat under a tree and another who lived in a tent to do some really great, incredible things. Deborah led the Israelites to victory. Yale KO'd the commander of the opposing army, who everybody was after. He'd been terrorizing Israel for 20 years, and Yale's the one who took him out. And he'd also escaped the Israelite troops. Now, we all like the movies, right? Think of a Hollywood movie. You're writing the, the cast and the script of the next blockbuster. If you've got an army, 900 tanks, who's going to be your hero to go and take out that army, right? It's going to be Iron Man, Captain America, the Hulk. God chose a lady who sits under a tree and a lady who lives under a tent. How many of us would make that same casting decision? We wouldn't, right? However, that's exactly who God chose. Also, in God's Word, the Bible that we read, have you thought about how special the entry is for Deborah in this occasion? Deborah was a judge like no other. There's obvi the obvious things. She was a lady. She was a prophetess. She had that different. However, look at her entry in the Bible. Both chapters 4 and 5 of Judges are dedicated to her time as a judge. There's some judges that got two verses. And they don't even tell who they took out. They were there, they lived, they died. That's it. She gets two, verse, two whole chapters. The battle is detailed in both prose and verse as a song. And this is the only battle led by a judge as a song written about it. None others. And afterwards, there's 40 years of peace. It's a whole lifetime, a whole generation's worth of peace after this battle. Deborah, in the, the song version in chapter 5, was given the title Mother of Israel. Title of honor, respect. The only other time that title is used in the Bible is in 2 Samuel 20, 19, when it's talking about a wise lady who saved the whole town from destruction. Only two people in the whole Bible get that, that designation. She was a judge like no other. Her accomplishments were incredible. What made Deborah such a great mother of Israel? What was it? She trusted in God. That's what serves to marry two ladies who are great mothers. I'm willing to bet there's a common theme in a lot of that. Those ladies that we love, how many of them can you think about your childhood and the times that they trusted in God and the times that they, they showed you the way? And our families, we may not have iron chariots to face down. However, we've all got challenges, right? We've all got things that try us. We've got our own trials in life. We've got those things that seem impossible to us. Having a strong love and trust for God, and that's what sees us through those challenges. And mothers have a special place in teaching that and preparing those families for those challenges, right? My lovely wife, she's teaching the children every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, all throughout the week. And that's a lesson that will carry those kids throughout their whole lives. Probably the most important lesson they'll ever learn. For all of us who've grown up with great mothers, who taught us to love and trust the Lord, we can attest that fact, can't we? No, I can my mom made a huge difference in my life. To all the mothers in our family, those who may hear this recording, remember to always trust in the God. Trust in the Lord and love Him, no matter the odds. God always comes through. He always wants to fight, and He always makes a difference in our lives. Remember that special place you hold as mothers and the effect that you have in all that you encounter, especially in our families. Like Deborah, 
living a life close to God can make all the difference. So I want to say thank you to all the mothers out there in the family of the Lord. And I want to say thank you to God for giving us the institution of families. And that's the message for today. Real quick, real simple. And as our tradition, we always extend an invitation. Join God's family. Because God's family is the greatest of all. And it's what makes us and individual families that much stronger, that much better. If you're thinking about things, if you've been reading and studying, if you'd like to take the next step in trusting God, you'd like to be baptized, now or any time is a wonderful time to do that. You can't pick a wrong time to do that, in fact. <laughs> if you'd like to be baptized, or if you have any other need to bring before the congregation, please let us know as we stand and we sing.